Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our public forum on the impacts of, on families and on communities of mobility for work. My name is Mike Clare. I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at the Harris Center here at Memorial University, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. We have a small but enthusiastic crowd here in the uh, Bruno Center for Innovation on the St. John's campus of Memorial University, and of course, there are those of you who are watching online. Welcome, everybody. I would like to begin by acknowledging that these lands are the historic territory of Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have always gone away from home for extended periods because of work. Whether it was to go 100 miles inland to cut trees for the paper companies during the winter, or to go up the Labrador to fish during the summer, or to go to the Great Lakes steamers that, to carry grain or iron ore. People in this province have been away from home for weeks or months at a time to earn a living. What seems to be different today is that more people seem to be commuting long distances for work than ever before, and they seem to be going farther, as far as Western Canada, West Africa, and even further. These Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are working and are remitting their incomes back home, allowing their spouses and children to remain in their home communities and thereby allowing these communities to remain sustainable. But their absence for long periods is having a profound impact on families and on communities. It is these impacts that we will be examining here this evening. We have a number of speakers, most of whom who are here with us in person, but a few appearing vi via video uh, connection. Uh, and as well, we have a short video, a short prepared video. So we're going to move quickly from one speaker to another, and we apologize in advance for the Coming in, comings and goings. There will be time after the presentation for you, the audience, to ask questions and to make comments. The Q&A session will be facilitated by the Executive Director of the Harris Center and the Office of Public Engagement, Dr. Rob Greenwood. For those of you watching the webcast, please submit your question or comment via email or Twitter at the addresses that will appear periodically at the bottom of your screen. My colleague, Kathy Newhook, here, will read them out at the appropriate times. The video of tonight's session will be archived on the Harris Center's website in a day or so, so feel free to watch it again and to refer it to your friends. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Barbara Nice, one of the leaders of the On the Move Partnership, the group of researchers and practitioners who have been studying the issue of work mobility for a number of years. Barb will provide a short overview of the research project and, and will then introduce the members of, the, of her team who will be addressing us. So please welcome Dr. Barb Nice to the podium. Thanks, Mike. It's going to be a very short overview because I have about one minute. <laughs> anyway, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for coming, and I hope we do have some people online. Uh, the On the Move Partnership it was, is actually a, an eight-year program of research. It's a national program of research funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Uh, Research Development Corporation of Newfoundland and Labrador and the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. Uh, it's many, many universities, uh, many co-investigators in multiple disciplines and over 100 trainees have participated in that project. And we're now in year six. So we're at the point uh, where we're trying to do some synthesis across the various components of the project, including research that's been happening in Northern British Columbia. Uh, and you'll hear from Greg Halseth tonight later on in the, in the program. Uh, who's based in the, at the University of Northern British Columbia in Alberta, and we'll hear from uh, Sarah DeRoe at the University of Alberta, uh, and uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador. Those are the three main pieces. But the research you'll hear from tonight is not simply from On the Move. Some of the research is also being done by other projects that are exploring similar themes to our own. And one of those is the Tale of Two Islands project uh, that involves Christina Murray, uh, and Doug Leonais, uh, and they're looking at mobile work in Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island. Uh, and there are some other projects as well that are feeding in here. So there are two main themes to tonight's uh, uh, program. One is the community impacts of extended commuting for work, uh, and the second one is family-related impacts. Uh, and the, On the Move is looking at many different types of mobility, daily commutes within cities on on uh, public transit, the Bell Island commute, uh, and so on. But tonight, most of our focus is going to be on fly-in, fly-out, drive-in, drive-out uh, types of, of commuting for work. So our first uh, speakers are going to be Kelly Vauden. 
Uh, Kelly is from the Grenfell campus. She's the Associate Vice President of Research at Grenfell. Uh, and Dr. Heather Hall, who's from the School of Environment, Enterprise, and Development at the University of Waterloo. And they are going to talk, uh, do a synthesis of the results on community impacts uh, uh, from this project in particular. And then uh, we'll have a virtual presenter second, uh, Dr. Sandrine Jean. Uh, Sandrine is a member of the anthropology department here, but she's presenting virtually, and she'll be doing a synthesis uh, from multiple projects looking at community or family-related impacts of extended absence for work. After their presentations, we'll move to a panel, and we have three panelists uh, tonight. One, the first panelist is Joe Bennett. He's the president and CEO of Long Harbor Development Corporation followed by Melissa Ralph, who's the founder of the Facebook group, Newfoundland Labrador Families Separated by Work. And then followed uh, the third panelist is Dr. Sarah DeRoe from the University of Alberta, who's done a great deal of research in the Fort McMurray uh, region uh, and has been working there for quite a long time. So I think that's it for me, Mike, and Heather and Kelly are up. All right, great. Thanks, Barb, and thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. So just to begin, since 2012, we've been looking at the community impacts of mobile work, trying to understand what those impacts are, and also what the respective responses have been by various groups, whether it's companies, union leaders, other government and non-government organizations. And Heather and I are presenting, but I should acknowledge that there's been a host of researchers across all of our teams in Newfoundland and Labrador and across the country who have contributed to this work. We're going to talk primarily about host and source, communi so host and source communities tonight, but there was a third kind of community that we identified as well, which is a hub community where people are moving through, for an where there's an airport, for example, for work purposes. Host communities are communities where workers go during their work period, and perhaps the best known of those in the country is Fort McMurray, Alberta. But in Newfoundland and Labrador, we also looked at Long Harbor, the Placentia, Argentia area, Sunnyside, Marystown, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Labrador West, Labrador City, and Wabush as host communities. Source communities are where workers reside, or where they consider their permanent place of residence to be. And this includes a large number of our communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. Some of those that we've looked at are Parker's Cove, Blaketown, St. John's, Paradise, Conception Bay South, Carboneer, the Northern Peninsula, and the Labrador Straits, among others. Our primary work in Newfoundland and Labrador for the Community Impacts theme has been in the Isthmus and the Avalon areas. But we've also, and particularly within that region, we've looked at Long Harbor, Newfoundland and Labrador. Joshua Barrett's here did his master's thesis, and you'll hear from Joe about Long Harbor as well. Uh, we've also done uh, work particularly in Deer Lake, which is one of these hub communities where people are traveling through, uh, at least uh, we're looking at the extent to which it is a hub community, to travel to other places for work. And we've also, over the last summer, Heather and I and uh, Leanna Butters, another trainee in the, in the project, went to Labrador and have explored various aspects of mobile work there. And we're also fortunate to have been working with colleagues in Nova Scotia, Alberta, British Columbia, and other provinces where they are also examining community impacts of mobile work and to be able to explore the similarities and differences in our experiences here in the province with theirs. So I'll turn it over to Heather. Our results have identified a number of community impacts from housing to roads, recreation, schools, hospitals, employment, income, sense of place, family dynamics, economic development, and planning. Perhaps not surprisingly, housing and spending have been the dominant themes in our analysis so far. For tonight, we're going to focus on housing, spending, infrastructure, competition for labor, and community development in our host and our source communities. So starting first with our host community impacts, and again, this is where workers are going to work. Our first impact is housing. Uh, many companies do build camps and other accommodations to house workers. But many of the workers will spend what's known as their living out allowances and actually rent in communities. As the quotation on the screen describes, every bed and every pillow is often in demand, whether it's a B&B or hotel or someone renting a room in their own home. 
Key informants in some regions noted that the high living out allowances often drive up the cost of rental properties in these communities, which in turn creates a crisis for affordable housing. In Labrador West, at the height of the boom, one key informant noted that rental rates were going anywhere from $3,000 for a two-bedroom apartment right up to $6,500 for a townhome. In the placenta area, another key informant described how some people not associated with the projects were given notice that they had to leave their homes or pay what they could get from the workers who were working at the site. And we have certainly seen this in other regions across the country. In terms of responses in Labrador West, the Newfoundland and Labrador Housing Corporation actually had to raise their rental cap income threshold from $32,500, which is the norm everywhere else in the province, to $65 thousand dollars there. They were the only exception within the province. And many communities have also been pushing for stricter rent control regulations to help deal with this issue. In terms of infrastructure, we do hear a lot about traffic concerns, especially uh, related to labor mobility in the Avalon and the Isthmus, as people move in and out of these communities during their daily commutes. In the Avalon, key informants describe the train of Ford F-150s leaving uh, every morning from St. John's and going out to Long Harbor and some of the other projects in the region. Well, in the Labrador Straits, we heard and certainly experienced firsthand the infrastructure impacts related not only to the construction of the traffic Labrador link from Muskrat Falls, but the amount of workers coming in and using uh, that infrastructure. As one key informant noted, the only thing that Muskrat Falls had done for that region was tore up the road and block the ferry. People often forget that increased traffic and the transportation of heavy machinery places increased pressure on the pavement and the infrastructure that's in underneath. Key informants were also quick to point out the disconnect between municipal costs related to these projects and the revenues they receive to pay for these increased pressures on infrastructure. One of the big impacts we heard about in Happy Valley Goose Bay was health care. Early on in the project, one healthcare professional described it as the Wild West in terms of medical clearance for people coming to work on such an isolated site. So now an already underfunded and understaffed health center was having to deal with people who had some pretty serious chronic diseases. And the second part was the employment uh, medical screening. And as you can see in this quote, they described it as a real pain in the ass for them to have to take on uh, because they didn't have the resources to even provide good access to primary care for the population that actually lives full time in Happy Valley Goose Bay, let alone having to deal with providing employment medical screening to the workers coming in to work at Muskrat Falls. And these extra responsibilities came with no additional money. We've also been hearing a lot about concerns related to substance abuse and mental health. These, this has been raised in both host and our source communities. Uh, across uh, Labrador, we heard about an increase in cocaine use. Uh, a number of key informants argue that with more money uh, brings more problems. And many associate the rise in drugs in the communities associated with the influx of people related to the projects, but also the high wages that they're bringing. In terms of local spending, we're hearing conflicting views on the economic impacts of mobile workers in these host communities. In addition to the people spending those living out allowances on accommodations, we did hear that some business had expanded their operations to try and accommodate the mobile workers. So we certainly heard about a new Tim Hortons being developed in Placentia, the new restaurants along the Trans-Canada Highway going to, uh, towards Long Harbor and Placentia. All attribute this new business activity to the economic benefits of the projects, but also the mobile workers passing through this region. We also heard about businesses altering their hours that they stayed open to accommodate the schedule of mobile workers. However, other businesses and host communities indicated that the positive impact was small, especially if the majority of workers stayed in the camps where food is typically brought in and cooked. Some local companies were able to get in as suppliers, but many did not, and key informants often discuss the lack of local procurement strategies associated with these projects. And finally, the influx of workers staying in rural communities created some pretty serious competition for the tourism sector. On the screen are two reviews from TripAdvisor for one establishment in the Labrador Straits. In both instances, tourists had their reservations canceled because mobile workers wanted to stay in the accommodations long term. So you had these small business owners having to make trade-offs between housing mobile workers versus their main industry, which is tourists. In response, two other hotel operators in the region decided to minimize the impacts on their tourism customers as much as possible. 
In one instance, the hotel owner actually purchased their own camp, which you can see in this photo, and situated it on their property. This meant that the workers would not compete with the tourists, and it had the added bonus of preventing that wear and tear in the actual hotel rooms, and this kind of contained the mobile workers to, to the camp accommodations. Another hotel blocked a certain number of rooms for the companies, but reserved uh, the rest for their tourists. And we've heard this tension play out across Labrador and the Isthmus. Now I'll turn it back over to Kelly, who's going to tell us about some of the source community impacts. So one of the areas we've been looking for other research on mobile workers and their impacts on communities is Australia. And Australian researcher Fiona Haslam McKenzie talks about that much of the research has happened about host communities, but there's an increasing interest in source communities. So I want to speak briefly about that. And a significant uh, number of our interviews and surveys, and we have done over 160 interviews and conducted uh, approximately 400 surveys uh, for this research, uh, we've been focusing a lot on, on source communities as well. And one of the, again, as Heather said, in, in both the host and the source cases, housing comes up as a dominant theme. And in terms of source communities, it's not hard to see the remittance economy at play, uh, including money from Alberta. You hear about Alberta money uh, taking the form of changes in the housing stock, stock in these communities. We have been seeing new homes being built and renovations that result in homes that look quite different in terms of their size and aesthetics than some of the traditional housing in these communities. These photos of, our new, of new houses and developments in the Buren Peninsula, in Marystown and in smaller communities such as Parker's Cove, where we have done a, a survey on, on spending. However, with the collapse in oil prices and change, changes in employment that have resulted, we are left questioning what, what this will mean in the future. So there's been changes in the value of these expensive homes that people have purchased or built. We've seen foreclosures and what's been described as white papers in the windows in some communities. And in others, the nature of development is changing once again as the economy changes. These changes in housing are also linked to changes in community character, which is a concern that has ra been raised in some of our interview interviews, how the nature of community changes, whether it's the look of the community or the dynamics in terms of family or the volunteer sector. Affordable housing is one of the reasons why people say that they've chose to stay in the communities where they live. And as the price of housing increases, that, that changes um, th that dynamic in the community, that strength of the community. Also, another reason why people stay in their communities but work elsewhere is their friends and family connections. Once again, as, as people are away for work, sometimes those connections can be uh, weakened. The other, uh, the second major area that uh, Heather mentioned is spending. So there's a real mixed, uh, a mix of results in terms of spending in source communities. Certainly the number one reason, the number one benefit that people talk about in terms of uh, the benefits of mobile work for source communities is just that there is employment and there's money in the community that otherwise wouldn't be there. Simply put, uh, many community leaders would say we wouldn't be here or certainly our community would be in far worse shape economically, uh, whether it's spending in local businesses or taxation for municipalities if, there weren't, if it weren't for mobile work. Uh, in 2014, interprovincial employment brought over a billion dollars in earnings into the province, uh, about 9.5% of employment earnings, and, that it, and those uh, benefits are particularly uh, acute in regions like the Southwest Coast and the Buren, and we've just done some analysis with local area data, and in areas like Rose Blanche uh, local area, 46% of employment earnings in 2014 from interprovincial employment, 35% uh, in Daniels Harbor, and so on. Of the 80, 80 local areas in the province, 38 had 20% or more of their employment earnings from interprovincial employment. So how are people spending this money? It varies. The big ticket items are generally bought in regional centers, centers such as St. John's. The Long Harbor case, Josh's research showed that the workers in their first few years of employment, the processing workers spent over $2 million in automobiles uh, in St. John's. So people are buying those big ticket items ten in larger centers. Recreational vehicles, uh, in the case of the, the Buren Peninsula, a lot of those are being bought in Marystown as well. So there's, again, a regional center. The uh, things like services that are available locally, food and, uh, food and um, other kinds of beverages, tend to be bought locally. So local um, 
providers are benefiting from that spending and when mobile workers are home for short periods of time or perhaps their, their spouses are, are home and having to, to handle a lot of things in the household, they might not want to travel as far for purchases. So we did hear people talk about that, wanting to shop locally more so, uh, even though in some cases they're not home as much to spend their money. So it's a complex picture in, in terms of the spending benefits. But certainly there's more income in these communities than there would be without mobile work. Uh, one of the other economic related impacts is the competition for labor though. Local small businesses are having to, are struggling to compete often for skilled workers with uh, Alberta wages, if you will, or, or bull arm wages, or muskrat balls wages. So there is uh, certainly something that we heard about losing workers to Alberta and to provincial projects in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, one business owner in Labrador Straits indicated they had to close down part of their business due to a labor shortage. And they also brought, have had to bring in temporary foreign workers to help fill, fill other positions. Our colleagues uh, in other provinces has, have had similar, seen similar results with a similar trend in Cape Breton, for example, uh, where Dr. Leone that uh, Barb mentioned earlier found entrepreneurial activity had diminished due to labor shortages. And businesses struggled to keep skilled workers because of the pull of the West. The region also saw a rise, and we heard this in Newfoundland and Labrador as well, in what was referred to as the black market competition, where mobile workers would work under the table when they were home on their rotations. The last kind of impact that I want to speak about is community development. So the, a lot of this was about the volunteer sector. People talked about whether people were engaging in their communities the same way as they would if they were not working away. When people come home, they often want to spend time with their families uh, and uh, engaged in, in other kinds of recreational activities that they may not be able to participate in when they're away. There seemed to be consensus in our interviews that mobile work had impacted the ability of individuals to participate in community events and to volunteer for things like volunteer firefighting, coaching for sports teams, and running for municipal councils. This undermines the social fabric of many communities and leads to volunteer burnout in other cases for those who remain and fill the void. While we heard that people are spending less time volunteering, we also heard in some cases they may be donating more money to local causes and we're still uh, investigating that further. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, but also in British Columbia, we heard about responses as well. More women in leadership, for example, often, certainly not always. Uh, these are male workers in, in many of the sectors, such as construction, oil and gas. And we are seeing uh, responses like increased flexibility in volunteer activities, asking people to participate when they can for very specific activities, rather than regular monthly meetings, for example. Uh, changing meeting times to respond to scheduling. Use of technology to allow people to participate at a distance. And regional agreements for emergency response uh, services, for example, so that multiple communities can collaborate on providing those services. We also heard a story about how hockey teams are now including multi more coaches, just in case. Or so that some weeks there are too many coaches around, but in other times uh, they've managed to have one or two. It's harder to get people out to events. We've loss of skills that we heard about in the employment sectors also applies in the volunteer sectors. And uh, groups are just struggling to respond to that. Just very quickly in closing, what this means for kind of policy and, and planning and practice. I think clearly the impacts on both our source and our host communities are complex and multifaceted with shifting so-called winners and losers. And part of the problem, especially in our host communities, is a real lack of planning and oversight on the socioeconomic or the human and community side of these projects. When development agreements are being drafted for their, these projects, there are no local procurement strategies, and there really is very little community engagement. We need to do a much better job questioning the long-term positive legacy of these projects and development on local communities. With labor mobility in particular, there's almost this assumption that workers will and can go away for work. And in many ways, this has become what Keith Story calls a de facto rural economic support program. Rather than invest in rural communities, we have become dependent on people going away for work. And mobile work has certainly become the means of community survival in many rural communities. We're also seeing the emergence of what we're calling the project economy develop, especially here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Especially for communities that have these large number of people working away on projects. They're pulling in huge incomes, and in many ways it creates false local economies. When asked whether people are looking towards the future and what they might do when the projects come to an end, nearly all key informants discuss the next project rumored to be in the works 
One key informant even argued that these communities need another project to survive. This is creating what Keith Story and I call the new single industry town, one in which workers are still dependent on employment in a particular sector and for a particular company in some instances, but at locations often far away from their own communities, which has huge implications for how we plan for impacts and respond. Thank you. Uh, Sandrine, are you online? So Sandrine uh, Jean is going to join us from Montreal online, if the magic of technology works. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Welcome. I'm just okay. going to change the presentation, Sandrine, uh, to, to yours, and then you'll have to let me know when to advance the slides. Okay? Okay. Uh, let me change that. All right. Go. I can go. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the goal of my presentation is to give an overview of the research result on family impacts of mobility for work. Uh, so the results that I'll be presenting tonight come from six years of field work Canada-wide, although mainly from researchers in research in uh, Newfoundland, different part of Newfoundland, Alberta, PEI, and Cape Breton. Uh, more than 180 interviews were undertaken, ranging for, from hour-long formal recorded interview to short conversation. It was done mostly with FIFA, FIFO, so uh, flying fly out workers and their families, spouse and children, along with other family members such as grandparents. Interviews took place at, took place at home, but as well as, as, as at work. Uh, most of these workers um, work in the oil and gas sectors mostly, with some in construction and all the caring workers around the industry, so kitchen and cleaning staff, for example, in, in work camp. Uh, in um, these interview, we also did uh, field work and interviews in four work camps in Alberta, in Fort McMurray, north of, north of Fort McMurray. Uh, 22 key informant interviews were done with teachers, counselors, health professionals, flight attendants, as well as three focus group interviews with mothers and grandmothers. Uh, 1,082 mothers, out of which 443 were, uh, that were in mobile relationship, also completed an online survey, which I'll be talking at the end. So next, on next slide, I want to thank uh, uh, different uh, researchers from the On The Move partnership um, that I'm drawing uh, uh, on, such as Marit Or, which is an international co-investigator uh, co working in Norway, uh, Sarah Doro, who's will virtually present tonight at the from University of Alberta, uh, Julie Gosselin, a psychologist at Memorial University, uh, myself that uh, I've been doing work uh, on mobility uh, between Newfoundland and Alberta, Doug Lianne and Christina Murray that um, Barb and Heather and, and Kelly mentioned about. So next slide. Um, at, there's five core teams emerging from on the move research that I'll be uh, covering tonight. So the first one on next, sli next slide is family and social networks are what enable and sustain uh, uh, RIGM, so employment related geogra geographical mobility. And next slide, the majority of research related to family impacts um, as you can see on the next slide, I've noted the strong reliance on extended family members and the importance of social networks. So this is exemplified by stories of uncle, cousin, brothers or sister going at the airport at 3 a.m. to pick up a worker, or grandparents taking on extra responsibilities such as looking after grandchildren. Results tend to support significant family impact across generation, whereas extended family are often involved in supporting rotational lifestyle. 
This is particularly true as there are several dual earner couples among long distance commuters. So this research finding is, is noteworthy because, you know, you, we often have the image of the stay at home mother that is benefiting from a paycheck check for, for a working offshore or out west husband, which is often conveyed in the media and really far away from the reality that these families are going through. Uh, mobile families are not relying only on extended family to help with uh, child care or other tasks, but they also need and seek emotional support. And we're lucky uh, to have tonight the founder of one of the Facebook groups, so she'll be talking about that space as being a, a safe space to discuss, offer support, advice, and guidance to mobile families. This, this second aspect team is the disruptive impact on routines and rhythms. So if extended the absence of home, as Mike mentioned, Mike Claire, uh, the extended absence of home from the purpose of work is not something new in Open and Labrador. What is relatively new is the increased frequency and duration of the spouse's presence and absence in and away from uh, the family home. So for example, the typical work shift, although this also tends to change in the mining oil and gas industry in Canada is 24 seven, meaning that 24 days at work and seven days off work. But for flying fly out Newfoundlanders traveling to Alberta, for example, seven days off work quickly end up being five days at home if you add up the time spent on commuting to and from work. So therefore, these workers are spending 60 days home each year, or only two months over a 12 months period. So on a yearly basis, it's an average of 24 reunions and departures with family, friends, and community. So many more departures and reunions disrupt routines and rhythms and often result in additional roles and responsibility for the home-based parents, which is for mostly for the, for the mother. So on the next slide, uh, on the move research has also shown that not only is those left behind that are struggling to adapt to rotational lifestyle, but also those who leave as well. So these results are particularly original as most of the literature focus on feminized unpaid la labor at home that anchors men's mobile work and not so much on the struggles of those who leave for their family behind for work. Uh, one of the most powerful quote in my study is from who, whom I decided to call Paul, Paul to preserve his identity, who is a, camp, a work camp manager. So he states, working here is a catch 21 because you do it for your family, but at the same time you give up on your family. So in order to provide for the family, to be the man provider, you're missing out on so many things from kids' first steps, sometimes even the birth school graduation, Christmases, birthdays, and so on. And all that for being stuck in an eight by eight rooms and working 12 hour shift will add another man interview in a work camp. So it's not a common for Sour Doro and me when doing interviews with workers in camp to see family pictures in workers' room to remind them of why they're doing this. So the, the next uh, slide is uh, the part of the presentation. We'll talk about the impacts on, on spouses, uh, couple relationship, and children. So uh, um, employment-related geographical mobility um, impacts uh, spouses and couple, uh, couple relationship from a renegotiation of roles and households duties to a direct impact on the home-based parent employment opportunities and career events advancement. If going out west for work can equate better income that benefits the whole family, it can also mean the final financial dependency for the, for the, for the women. Uh, several couples interviewed uh, stressed the impact of being separated uh, uh, on their couple life and having considered divorce. divorce. Yet some couples flourish in rotational lifestyles and stated that they wouldn't change even though the, the opportunity came around. And not only parents and grandparents take on additional responsibilities when spouses await children to uh, Christina Marine Dugley and a research in PEI in Cape Breton highlight, for example, 
children having to grow up early and taking on more responsibility, especially younger boys. They note several reactions to the father intermittent absences from sadness out, uh, when daddy leaves to excitement when he returns. An interview with a school teacher in the southern shore of Newfoundland who will confirm several cases of children acting out at school as a result. Uh, different tactics are used to reduce negative impacts on children, such as countdown calendar to help children understand why most likely dad is away so often, um, uh, while most kids don't understand time as such. Maintaining contact with kids and spouse of staying connected despite the distance, the time difference, the remoteness and problems with internet connection were also mentioned by a majority of family interviewed. Uh, family impacts are gender, meaning that mobility for work impacts women and men differently. Uh, regular back and forth um, of rotational and mobile workers between a far away workplace and also call for unconventional temporal and spatial reconfigurations of gender roles and relations. Sarah Jaro and Marit R have found that if long distant commuting tend to reinforce traditional division of labor of the breadwinning role of the father versus the stay-at-home mother, it can, it can also challenge it. This, ex this is exemplified in this quote where the wife has to step up and be the alpha in the absence of the father. Yet many male mobile workers with families educated that regular sustained absences from home made, made them feel that they had less a right to exercise their fathering role. Um, impacts on health and well-being, whether it's mental, physical, or reproductive, were also uh, noted in the interviews. Uh, mental health, such as stress, depression, anxiety, as being a prominent, prominent topic um, during the interviews. So were isolation, loneliness, and that was not only for the ones left behind, but also for those who, who leave for work. Concerns over the commute in hazardous conditions, no storms and delays, but also with work injuries and broader physical health outcomes were also major concerns. Others just stress sexual difficulties, problems with conception and infertility. It can indeed be difficult to try to conceive when your partner is only there a couple of weeks a year. Yet our result highlight that there's a lack of professional resources available to deal with the needs of mobile workers and their families, and that the quality of care provided to mobile worker is often compromised due to, for example, scheduling conflicts. Uh, before I conclude, I want to bring your attention to the NL survey on motherhood in the next slide, which is a provincial data collection regarding the maternal experience of mothers in Newfoundland and Labrador. So was, the survey was launched in February 2017 by a team led by Dr. Julie Gosselin at Memorial in Psychology, and an impressive number of two, uh, 1,082 mothers completed the 20, 30-minute online survey. Uh, these mothers, uh, a quarter of them were from are from rural Newfoundland uh, and three quarter from urban. And out, out of the, that 1,082 mothers, uh, 443 mothers, mothers uh, mentioned that they were leaving or used to be leaving in a mobile relationship. Interestingly, uh, 6% of them uh, stated that children had been conceived through assisted reproductive technology. So just to let you know, stay tuned for upcoming quantitative analysis and, and more interviews with mobiles, um, mothers in mobile relationship that will be done in the next months. In conclusion, um, uh, I want to emphasize the need to raise awareness and understanding regarding the significance of employment-related geographical mobility in Canada, and particularly in Atlantic Canada. So we've seen that uh, mobility for work impacts not only mobile workers and their families, but also children, relatives, and extended family members to all communities. It influences their health and well-being, yet there is a lack of services offered to mobile workers and their family. Uh, so we will be hosting um, a, day and, a two days and a half symposium in the P, uh, PI in May 2008 to try to 
bring uh, multiple sectors to discuss those issues regarding families, uh, work, and mobility. So finally, I invite you to get in touch if you want to have any more information about any research presented uh, tonight, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, I will now ask uh, Joe Bennett and uh, Melissa Ralph to come to the front. And uh, Sarah Doro is also going to join us uh, via video conference in a few minutes. So please. Uh, and I think, uh, Joe, perhaps you're speaking first. Oh, drum roll. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> well, Mike tells me I have five minutes. So I felt like I had to speak like somebody from Upper Island Cove on steroids to get through all this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I come from an impacted community, I guess, and, and uh, the perspective that I bring is the perspective of a community uh, who have been impacted by the whole mobile worker syndrome. I'd like to start this by introducing the, the main characters of the company and the town. And just to give you a perspective of what we're dealing with, the company is Valet, SA, their home office in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The company is 75 years old. Uh, the area covered is worldwide. Their revenue in 2016 was $30 billion. Their net income in 2016 was $4 billion. And the number of employees were 76,531. 20,000 of them were lawyers, I'm sure. <laughs> and now the other character in the play, Long Harbor, Mount Arlington Heights, the community. Location, the bottom of Placentia Bay, Newfoundland. Community settled in the early 1800s. Incorporated in 1968. Population, less than 300. Pre-budget construction. The budget in the community pre-budget to construction, $180,000 per year. Traditional industry, indoor fishing. Industrial experience. Operation site for the Albright and Wilson Elemental Phosphorus Plant for over 20 years. That plant closed in 1989. This coincided with the cod moratorium. This impact was large out-migration from a community of 750 residents to one of less than 200. Employment, approximately 30 percent. Population, aging. Most valuable real estate, cemetery plot. That was no kidding. So this is what we were faced with when we got the call and I know I dramatized this a little bit, but the call went something like this. It was a phone call, perhaps. Hello, Mr. Mayor, this is the, Vice Pre this is the President of Valet speaking. I'm calling to advise you that our company is coming to your town and we're going to build a, the most technologically advanced hydromet nickel processing plant on, on planet Earth. We're going to have a workforce in your community of close to 5,000 professionals, trades, and administrative support staff. The current construction budget, $1.8 billion. I assume you're ready. <laughs> right. And that was the situation that Mayor Gary Keating was faced with when that call came. So there were some in the community that thought this would be a threat. <laughs> no kidding. And others saw an opportunity. So the impact on the community although we had some lead time for this project because Ballet had been running a demonstration plant in Argentia, Newfoundland, uh, to prove their operational theory and their, that the hydromet plant could be, you know, a viable uh, plant production system. It was a new process. But getting ready to the main, for the main event was building the permanent plant site in Long Harbor proved to be an enormous challenge, to say the least. 
Now, some earlier on in their presentations made reference to housing. So, so when we were a little community, there were no hotels in Long Harbor. You can appreciate the fact that the Delta had not discovered us. So there were a series of immediate impacts. One of the things when the workers come in just doing the heavy civil work, per site pre preparation, which took an enormous amount of time, was it's a big site. If I did a, a site overlay, the site would stretch from the Hotel Newfoundland, or whatever it's called these days, all the way up to and including uh, close to the railway station. That's the site, the geographic site footprint that would go from the south end Water Street to the north end to the Basilica. So to give you an idea of the site. Matter of fact, I was joking with some of my friends from Ocoa the other day who were talking about the size of their projects. And they're all up on visiting the valet site. And I asked one of them, how many street names are in your project? <laughs> <laughs> so housing became the initial uh, impact. So what happened was, of course, Constructors and workers were coming to town. They were traveling great distances, either from St. John's and rural areas. They were skilled workers doing heavy civil work. They needed a place to stay. There was no place to stay, of course. That was of the commercial nature. So people who had a bedroom, a house, or something uh, found themselves in the catering business looking after construction workers. So what we had was senior citizens, because the town had had a lot of senior citizens there with a lot of empty bedrooms, found themselves playing host. There was voices, movement, laughter in their houses again that hadn't been there for many, many years. But also there was income that had not been there for many, many years. So was this a win for those people? Absolutely. Did it have an immediate impact? Absolutely. Is it still having an impact? Absolutely. But not only did it have an impact on Long Harbor, it had an impact on every community in the area including Placentia, Dunville, Blaketown, along the Trinity Shore, Whitburn, Chapel Iron, and many other communities in the region, all benefited from the fact that because we were not ready for this influx of mobile workers, we had to provide and we had to make do. And the only way we could make do was take what resources we had and apply them to the situation. So Long Harbor had other responses to the mobile workers beyond the immediate impacts of the community. There were, there were those who saw a business opportunity. We had investors who came to town and purchased some property from the town and built what we called the mini homes, a fancy word for trailers. And then there were those who saw another opportunity and, and purchased some land, which we helped them do as Long Harbor Development Corporation, and they built a hotel. But in each case, all of those units were taken up by ballet as the primary tenant, and they sublet them to the contract workers that were coming to town to do work on their behalf. So here we had all the homes in the, in the town were taken up for, with mobile workers, uh, 24, maybe two dozen or two dozen and a half mobile homes were put on site in a, in a, in a subdivision. And in addition to that, uh, there was one entrepreneur who built a hotel. It was uh, one of the most successful hotels in the history of Newfoundland as a startup for the simple reason that every room in that hotel was purchased for close to a 10 year period. 100% occupancy. I'll take that deal any day of the rest. <laughs> Having some background there. <laughs> so the other thing that uh, had a positive impact on the, town was the, on the town's municipal tax base. That hotel, for example, that was built by that, that uh, entrepreneur, uh, the tax revenue from that one facility alone, the, the business taxes and the property taxes from that one property alone was greater than all the residential taxes in the town combined. And you say, wow, yeah, but we only had 200 people. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, impact on a community and impact on a town's budget was enormous. And the downside, of course, of uh, that thing is that the residents felt a little bit put out for the fact, for the simple fact they had a brand new hotel in their town with beautiful rooms and were serving very nice meals to the people who were occupying the hotel, but they had no access to the hotel. The hotel was private. And 
fact, it actually was it's almost like a residence or a bedroom for the, for the workers, so they couldn't go there for a coffee, they couldn't there go there for a meal, or they couldn't invite anybody to stay there who came to visit them. So that caused a little bit of, of resentment, I would suspect, because this was only built for them and not really built for us to begin with. So instead of calling it the hotel, we started to call it the lodge. Semantics could be anything in a small town. So but both facilities at this stage of the game are underutilized and the future is not yet determined. Now that we have gone from the construction phase to the operational phase, uh, these, these facilities now are up in the air and, and they're privately owned. But the other valet's response was to build a campsite, a thousand room uh, campsite to accommodate mobile workers. So when they built that campsite, they started that campsite, of course, after they started the construction of the site. So all the workers who were coming there for a couple of years up to that point uh, had been uh, exercising, as somebody mentioned, the living out allowance. And they were living in these homes in, you know, down in Blaketown or in Placentia or Whitburn or Long Harbor. And they were taking up the advantage of their probably $80 to $120 a day living out allowance. So what was happening is the three or four workers came together, uh, they rented a house, they pooled their money, and they took 50% of their living out allowance and put it in their jeans pocket. That's what, that was reality. So two years too late, Valet built a thousand person camp and nobody wanted to stay in it. They didn't want to stay in it because if they did, they would lose their living out allowance because no longer living out. So being sm smart, intelligent Canadians, they took the path of least resistance and stayed where they were and continued to take their living out allowance. This, I would suggest to you, cost the company a lot of money. Uh, some of the other things, how am I doing, Mike? Oh, I know I spellbound you and you forgot to look at your watch, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wanted to, uh, there's, there's a lot to, that I could talk about. Town services, of course, is another thing that that the mayor was very concerned about. And uh, so, so what would we do? We're, you know, it was a very old town. Our infrastructure was, was being dilapidated and falling apart. But so we, we had, uh, at one time, you know, in the little town of community, we had two service stations, two churches, two schools, two post offices, and six, six convenience stores in that little community. And when Ballet arrived, we had one church and one convenience store. So to give you an idea, the reversal of impact. So consequently, the opportunity to drive significant economic benefit by servicing thousands of mobile workers who were in our community for six to seven years was lost. What those workers did buy pizzas in Placentia, and coffee in Whitburn. I often relate the story if the, these workers get out of bed at five o'clock in the morning in St. John's to be at work at seven o'clock in Long Harbor. And if you're ever on the highway at those times, and there were many stories about this, it always reminded me of the cartoon, you know, you're going out on the highway, 105, 110, 115 kilometers an hour, side burns blown into breeze, cigarette on one side, toothpick out of the other, windows down, that big old red flag on the back of the pickup going whip, 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 whip. And then you hit the brakes straight around Robbins and eh, eh, coffee time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. As far as the eye could see, nothing but taillights of Ford F-150s with one driver. Absolutely amazing. Employment became the other issue, of course. Employment was a big concern to you know, the mobile workers coming in, but also the residents who had an expectation because of earlier conversations with the previous owner who, were, uh, who, who gave almost assurances to the community that anybody in Long Harbor who wanted to work would have a job. That wasn't, wasn't, it never transpired that way at all. And hopefully later I'll give it a chance to talk about the process that Ballet went through, and I got a zero. I feel like I'm back in school, Mike. <laughs> anyway, I will probably save some of my other points. I'd like to talk about employment. I'd like to talk about special projects. I'd like to talk about theories of community development that, uh, that have taken place. And there have been many, many, many benefits derived being the host community of the most technologically advanced nickel processing plant in the world. But I'll, I'll, I'll relent. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I was 
honor to be asked, and uh, my point of view is a much more personal one, so it's going to be a different story that you'll be hearing from me from um, all the other speakers that I've heard here tonight. Um, so my name is Melissa Ralph, and I created a Facebook group, which is a support group for uh, workers and their families and friends who are impacted um, by the separations um, that happen because uh, having them travel for work outside the province or within the province. So I'll tell you a little bit about me and how that came about. Um, so I met my partner in 2003, and at that time we both worked, you know, your typical nine to five uh, jobs. Uh, evenings, some weekends, but uh, not long after we moved in together. And even if our work schedules conflicted, we always came home uh, at the end of the day and, um, you know, able to uh, reconnect and, uh, and see each other. Uh, but in 2008, uh, frustrated with the lack of opportunity in Newfoundland, um, he made the move to Alberta to look for work in the oil field. So we committed to maintaining a long distance relationship and that year I saw him a total of three times. So I moved to Alberta in 2009 and he still traveled a lot and uh, I didn't expect it, but I was there um, as a new resident in Alberta and he was still working away more than he was home. Uh, so our relationship progressed and we planned to marry and we wanted to start a family, um, but we really wanted to return to Newfoundland to begin that next chapter of our lives. So um, actually in the spring of 2011, uh, he received a transfer and he came back to Newfoundland. Well, we both came back and he started working uh, offshore. Uh, we married later that year in 2011 and uh, then we were blessed with a baby boy in 2013. And here I was, a new mom, very little support, uh, a husband working offshore weeks at a time. Uh, to make it even harder, communication is very limited. Um, it still is. Uh, I worried about his safety on the job. Uh, I wondered if I'd preoccupied his mind by a prior heated conversation or a tearful rant of everything that went wrong for me that day. Uh, so that was very difficult for my husband as well to leave me and to leave our son knowing he couldn't always be there when we needed him. Uh, so I reached out to local parenting groups, uh, but I was really met with um, oil money stereotypes and uh, very little empathy and little support. So um, I realized then that supports for transient workers, uh, partners, families, um, was practically non-existent. Uh, so to change that, I turned to Facebook and created Newfoundland families separated by work to help fill that void. Uh, initially, it was really difficult to find information geared towards uh, supporting individuals who are impacted by this way of life. We call it a lifestyle in our group, uh, fondly known as. Uh, but over the years, I've managed to compile a list of uh, really helpful resources and tools. Uh, the CBS uh, Family Resource Center actually provided uh, the group with materials and workbooks uh, from uh, a previously run program that they used to do. I, I don't know why they don't do it anymore, but it was called Home Again, Gone Again. Um, uh, we also included uh, health resources, uh, such as contact information for marital counselors, uh, family counselors, when the struggles of being separated are just really uh, too much to bear on our own. Uh, we also highlight local businesses, so anyone who, you know, can deliver groceries, uh, do snow clearing. Uh, we have uh, a lot of files that uh, our members can access. So um, my husband and I have since had another child. We had a baby girl in 2015. I work full-time as well outside of the home, uh, so that brings a lot of uh, unique challenges for us. And uh, they continue, it's daily. You know, our children grow, uh, they're changing. Uh, we both are looking to try to advance in our careers, um, all while trying to stay connected. And as you can imagine, maintaining a healthy relationship um, when really we're only under the same roof for half the year, if that, uh, it's really hard work. Um, it's not something that we'd ever be able to do without encouragement and understanding. And uh, I have found that in the growing virtual community and uh, through other members, um, you know, even in the, the hardest times, I've learned the importance of recognizing the positives of the lifestyle 
how grateful we are for the times where we are together um, and how we can really make that time meaningful for us as a, a married couple and for our children and uh, as a, a family unit. So um, Newfoundland families separated by work. It's involved to include people uh, in many different careers, not just offshore. Um, but our, uh, our experiences and our stories, um, they really connect us and bring us together. And we've grown from a group with one member, me, um, to a second admin uh, and contributor to the group, uh, uh, Amy Chislett, and uh, almost 500 members now. So um, it's, it's grown into you know, a really uh, great support uh, system today. And I hope that we continue to grow. And I'm really excited that um, people are um, looking at the impact of the families and the impact of the communities because uh, you know I it's really unique. And my challenges are not the same as another person's challenges when you know everyone come back comes back together at the end of the day. So uh, thank you. And uh, it was really interesting to hear all of the other um, points of view as well. It was enlightening. Thank you. John, will you connect uh, Sarah to the to the screen? Can you hear us, Sarah? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We can't see you. There you are. Okay. Okay, I'm there. Good. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to be joining you uh, here today from uh, Edmonton and, and a really wonderful set of presentations already. So I sort of feel like I'm chiming in at the end and, and, and bringing things together that have already been so wonderfully um, brought up. Um, as Barb indicated, uh, my comments and perspective stem from a decade of research in the Fort McMurray and oil sands region uh, in northeast Alberta, both in the community of Fort McMurray and in work camps. Um, and this particular history of research uh, means that uh, a couple of key things I think are germane to the to the uh, presentations and the, and the conversation today. And I hope my perspective extends and builds on what's been brought already through the sort of lens of Fort McMurray. Um, so what they said, you know, plus. Um, so first, uh, because my work has taken place uh, during uh, two. Uh, boom bust cycles, you know, from the heady days of the early 2000s to the bust of, of uh, 2008, and then the d upturn again, and then the downturn in late 2014, uh, and then the fire of uh, a year and a half ago. Um, my work sort of forces attention to impacts of mobile work in relation to this broader picture of socio historical changes, and especially political and economic changes in the oil sands economy. So these changes are over time, I think, are really crucial um, to understanding the effects of mobility on families and individuals and communities because they breed um, sort of uncertainties and they mark different kinds of impacts. Um, including how the types and levels of costs of the costs of mobility um, are, are, are borne differently over time, right, as the conditions of mobile work change. So I want to sort of explain briefly sort of three phases in that time I've been doing research because I think they're really helpful for thinking about uh, mobile work in relation to community um, and family impacts. So the first phase of my research in 2007, the main concern at that time um, was the impact of the so-called shadow population uh, on neighborhoods and quality of life in Fort McMurray. These were most people living in town, in basement suites and hotels, uh, uh, you know, dentists, construction workers, um, you name it. Um, and you know, the complaint in the community was these people are gumming up the streets with their big trucks. Uh, and uh, a story we heard over and over again was people throwing their Tim Hortons cups out the window of their truck as they drove down the street, sort of demonstrating a, a lack of commitment to the community. And you know, to relate to what Joe was was saying, you know, this was a time when the town grew from. Uh, 35,000 people to over 70,000 people, right, um, in, a, in a short period of time, including with the high living out allowances, but it also um, impacting uh, both rent and and uh, and uh, housing prices. So over time, those concerns remained, but they were joined by the fact that uh, in the years after that, um, there was a rapid increase in the use of mobile work camps. Um, so the you know, that that went from you know. Uh, 
um, uh, only a few thousand people in work camps in 2007 to over 50,000 by 2012. Uh, and so this in rapid increase in the use of mobile work camps um, really um, made a difference for the relationship between industry and community, but also sort of the, the way that the impact of mobile workers was understood and, and made sense of in that context. So, you know, there were more than 100 work camps at the height um, of the use of work camps. Um, and uh, of course, the impacts on community, you know, it, that people were especially concerned with um, was the use of services in town. So health services, social services, uh, retail services, et cetera. But as many, many people said, without paying taxes here, right? Um, so many participants were frustrated that people were living in work camps, maybe using services in town, but not spending as much money as, as they would like, uh, but not, and also not paying taxes in, in the region. Um, so to sort of spin off of what Heather and Kelly have pointed out, um, and drawing on Keith Story's work, I would suggest that um, mobile work becomes a kind of de facto oil industry labor flow management program um, in, in within the work camp system, and that has very particular kinds of impacts. Um, and it also raises the question of sort of who's responsible for those impacts and in what way, um, especially when you know, it's not just the main oil companies bringing in mobile workers, but all the subcontractors and, and construction companies. And so sort of spreading around that responsibility of uh, is gets more difficult as you have more players um, in the game. And uh, so that's a complicated picture I can talk more about if you'd like. There's kind of a third phase now, I would say, um, in, in the region. Um, we've had the two downturns in the space of five years, real changes in the oil economy where there are more unconventional forms of oil coming on globally that bitumen can't compete with in the same way. Um, uh, also policy changes. So related to what Joe was discussing, um, a new bill in Alberta um, that reduces the possible ratio of non-residential tax rates to residential tax rates from 18 to 1 to now 5 to 1 as the maximum. So Fort McMurray, the municipality that it's a part of, can't actually, will not be able to charge as much or, or, or bring in as much tax revenue um, from oil industry as it used to. It's being reduced drastically. So all of these sort of uncertainties and the fire um, had what I, you know, breed what I call a new age of uncertainty um, about the viability of the community going into the future. What can it be? What kinds of investments should or shouldn't be made in its infrastructure? Um, how can you even attract people to live there? Uh, so all these, these questions are really alive right now in a place like Fort McMurray. Um, it also means uncertainty for mobile workers, right? Um, if you're not in operations and maintenance, um, you know, how much sort of project-based construction work is there? Will the cost of travel be covered? That kind of thing, okay? So to give one quick example of how these various contingencies play out in people's lives, um, with the down we found that more workers report having to pay their own mobility, their own transportation costs, um, which in turn has an impact on those trade-offs of money and family. You know, do you go home after every rotation or save a bit more money for your family and stay longer and thus have, you know, get, have a more negative impact on family um, experiences? Um, and, and so those kinds of things really, um, those kinds of trade-offs really get um, palpable for people. A second key insight from my research that, that I think might be germane, and I want to thank Kelly, uh, Kelly and Heather because their work is actually, uh, in reading through it again yesterday, it, it made me realize something about Fort McMurray, um, and that it highlights how the city of Fort McMurray it bears the opportunities and challenges of being both a source and uh, I would both a host and I would argue a source community um, at the same time, and sort of blurs the lines between those categories. We usually think of Fort McMurray as host, right, as a host community, right? Um, the you know the all the workers coming in and and uh, and hosting uh, for work uh, in the oil sands, um, as some of the other, other people have described. Um, but at the in the height of the boom, there were certainly thousands of mobile workers, as I described, in the city. Um, living in basement suites, et cetera. Um, and, and then also um, Fort McMurray at the time laid claim to the largest trailer park in, in Canada. Um, but at the same time, the census shows that Fort McMurray has had one of the highest rates of moving both in and out within one in five years. So people going there on the three or five year plan, also sort of family and worker mobility going maybe for a few years at a time as Melissa um, described. Again, blurring the lines between resident and mobile worker. And many of these people um, did indeed buy homes at high prices in a tight market and spent their or high oil sand salaries on the kinds of quads and trucks um, that were described by Kelly and Heather um, with regard to source communities. 
Um, but also, really important, all of these oil workers, well, most of them anyway, whether they're with families or whether they're living in a basement suite and there is a single person, are commuting out to site every day. Uh, um, during the height of the boom, Fort McMurray had the highest daily commute in the country. Uh, and, so in, and so you also then have it being a, a source community in the sense that you have people taking 12 to 14 hours a day um, to get out to site, do their shift, and come back. Uh, effect effectively leaving a spouse, um, anchoring the household during the rotation because they're home just to eat and sleep and then get up and do it all over again. And in some cases, you know, people who live there are actually staying out at camp, um, who live in Fort McMurray are actually staying out at camp for days or a week at a time, uh, given, depending on the demands of the job. And in other cases, both individuals and a couple are working at its site, uh, making the balance of work and family very tricky indeed, and with heavy reliance then on live-in caregivers. Um, in part because of the absence of extended family uh, within the community, which is, a, again, a sort of a blurring of source and host communities. Um, I should also point out the same is true of indigenous communities in the area um, who are near to project sites and they see hotels springing up and, uh, you know, to, to house mobile workers at the same time that members of their own community are maybe commuting long distance or even flying in and out um, of remote projects. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of both going on, right, of source and host. Um, they also have the source issues in Fort McMurray of uh, labor short, volunteer shortage and labor shortage for non-oil work. Uh, uh, but at the same time, a lot of new entrepreneurialism. Um, so there's a lot of different things, things going on there. Um, just to sort of uh, wrap up, I'll point out a few random things that, that, I, that I think are useful to, to point out. Um, one of that, them has to do with, you know, this, the impact depends, to, to echo what Melissa said. Um, and it part depends, the impacts depend on where people are in their life course. Uh, and, and, you know, Sandrine has pointed this out as well. So we met older people, sometimes couples with grown children who are really enjoying their time away as mobile workers. Uh, had found a really good rhythm for living apart together and actually kind of enjoyed the you know, having separate lives and then coming back together. Um, so where you are in your life course can, can really make a difference. Um, I would also um, want to, to point out again that I think there's more need for work on indigenous communities and the impacts uh, of, of uh, oil projects and resource projects um, on them as both host and source. Um, and it wouldn't it be grand to, to build on what Melissa was and the work that Melissa's doing in, in her in, with her uh, virtual community. Um, I, I've often thought it'd be really grand to, and I haven't come up with this wonderful plan, um, but to find ways of, of having networks of support that actually span um, work camps or, or you know, uh, host communities and source communities, and whether those be online sort of sources of support, because there are all kinds of forms of care that travel, but also have challenges traveling between. Uh, host and source, and, and, and what, would, what might those supports look like um, between, uh, that would actually span across them. Um, and uh, to end, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I think the case of Fort McMurray is really interesting um, in that it, it highlights and, and complicates um, the picture of impacts on families and communities. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Before we move to the Q&A session, I'll just show a nine-minute film that, that uh, kind of puts things in context. Uh, and Melissa and Joe, you may want to see the film better. So the, the film you're going to see is our first digital story, uh, of, and it's a, a couple. Uh, Bob and Pauline, who live in, in Bedford, uh and uh, who were uh, basically affected by the COD moratorium, ended up in mobile work and now live back in Bedford. And uh, it was put together by George Gamelch, uh, an anthropologist from California who's been working with the project, and Diane Royale, a uh, graduate student who's worked with him, uh, as well as Dennis Lanson, um, and Derek Norman here at the university, and Andrew Lincoln and Jacqueline Cepeda. And uh, George and Dennis are, are, have actually put together a trailer for a feature-length film on uh, mobile couples in Newfoundland and Labrador. So they're hoping to, to make a feature-length film eventually. But uh, so this is, is just one story before we move to the Q&A.
where did we meet Polly? We met over in the hall at a There's concert. A hall. I thought it was back room club. No. So we're fighting already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well keep her going. <laughs> we we met over in the hall. You were playing on a Christmas concert. Oh, yeah, yeah. You were singing, and me and Donna, my friend Donna, went to the concert. I said to Donna, I said, Donna, I'm going to marry that man up there on that stage. This was our wedding day, small family wedding. Um, I guess you could say is what they call a shotgun wedding here in Newfoundland. You can't really tell, but I'm about seven months pregnant here with Jennifer. <laughs> our second, we already had Stephen. Raising kids in outport communities, they, they, they just got the whole sense of freedom. You can let them go anywhere in the harbor. You don't have to have fences, pin them in your backyard. You're not worried about anyone. Everyone looks after them. If they got in trouble or they strayed a little ways, someone would call and say, do you know Stephen is down here? He's all right here, just letting you know. Somebody always knows where your children are and somebody is keeping an eye on them. We both worked in the plant. We tried, I think Bob worked day shift and I work night shift, right? Mm -hmm. I could be home with the kids in the daytime, and he was home with them in the nighttime. One of the best things I ever did, that, to me, was one of the best things I ever did. I, I felt better when I went fishing than I was in that plant. I liked on the water, catching the fish, you know, there was, especially when the fish was there, like, you know, there was, you know, and you you catch like a couple thousand pound of fish, you know. And you look and you look in there in the, in the what they call the pound of the boat where all the fish is stored, like. And you can say, my God, did we catch that fish today? I mean, you got a fine dollar for it. You know, you you had a good day's catch, like you know. And you couldn't wait till the next day to get back out there again to to, to try it again, like you know. I remember me and my brother, we uh, went down on top of the wharf down here. And then we sat there waiting for John Crosby to come on and, and uh, with his announcement about it all. And I tell you, when he came on, I, uh, it's like you couldn't believe what he was saying. Like you didn't want to hear it. Sad, like you could almost cry. You know, that's how sad it felt. And, but uh, we knew you must go on. You, you just couldn't stop. You had to do something. Shortly after that, those friends of ours, they were heading out west to Alberta in the oil fields. And uh, we, we were asked to go out there like for our friends, come on with us, come on with us. And uh, we hesitated because that was an unknown territory to us, and we didn't want to go there. But uh, a couple of years later, wife and I, we, we said, let's, let's do it. Those trailers, like trailers. those long trailers, uh -huh. very long trailers. And uh, we had about, anyway, from 40 rooms in it, 20 on each side of the buildings inside, and that's what our work was. I had to do one of those every day, and Pauline had to do one of those every day. Like cleaning. Like cleaning, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We spent Christmas out west. Well, one and only one, wasn't it? It was the saddest time of my life. We were sitting in uh, an apartment looking after another lady's cats that we worked with. We couldn't find a turkey. We found Two turkey wings, didn't we? Two big turkey, two wings. big turkey wings. That's all was at the uh, No Frills grocery store that we went to down the road. And we cooked the two turkey wings. And I don't think either one of us, either one of us ate them. We were, we were too sad. We were doing too much crying. And then, of course, our daughter called us from here. She was out here with Stephen. Because Stephen looked after the house, stayed at the house while we were out west. And uh, 
She called us and that only made things worse. We spent Christmas Day crying and kicking ourselves in the arse for being out there. And we vowed that we would never again spend Christmas away from home. We own the uh, old house here. And uh, it was a, a shed where my husband used to store his fishing gear. He had his fishing gear in there for a couple of years. And uh, I said to Bob one day, I said, Bob, go up and take everything out of Jimmy's house. I said, I'm going to turn that into a bed and breakfast. Polly picked up a lot of tricks of the trade, as they say, mm -hmm. how it's done, like, you know, a cleaning and all this, because everything out there had to be the same way. Everything got to be sanitized and bathrooms and all that. She picked all that up. And I guess when, she went, when we opened up the B&B, &B, she knew exactly what to, what to be doing, like, you know. We're very happy with the choices that we made, and we're very happy with the bed and breakfast itself. We've had people from all over the world, and I love people. I love catering to people. Oh, I love talking to people who, yeah, we sit down every morning for breakfast, we get a cup of coffee and sit down, and we'll talk about their life and our lives. You know, people like in, in like in Beatty Bird, our community here in Beatty Bird, everybody loves the community. They like here, you know, they just like here. But like I said, sometimes things go wrong, you know, like the fishery and stuff like that, like, you know, and then the people move away to work in St. John's and places like that. And like I said, the younger people, they don't, they don't hang around here now. They come out of school. And they got in the university and getting the degrees and whatever. And like, that's why I said in 20 years' time, and all us will be all die off, the Wola people. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. Baby Bird is home. It's where we both grew up, it's where our families came from, and it's where we made our living, it's where we raised our children. And there is a rugged beauty and peacefulness here in Beatty Bird that I don't think that I could find anywhere else in this world. It's just home. It's home to me. Wow. I'm Rob Greenwood, the Harris Center, and we have had the pleasure of partnering with Barb and her team on, on this project, so delighted to be here tonight. We've got a small but enthusiastic, dynamic crowd here, I know by knowing most of the people in the room, and we're webcast, so we have people who will be able to email in questions. And we can draw on not just the people on the panel, but also people on the team who are on, in the room or connected via all the technology we have going here. So we have a couple of mics in the room. You, we can get a mic to you if you put up your hand. Uh, and you can introduce yourself, make a comment, ask a question. We've got all this horsepower we can draw on. Try to be succinct. Let's see, Ah, oh, right on. New Susan wouldn't let us down. Surprise, surprise. You can introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Susan Shirk, and I just have to, this brought back to me, um, I think it was 1980, and I was working in New York City, and my husband was uh, working in Toronto, and we lived in Newfoundland. And uh, we commuted, and it was always a problem as to where we would commute because our home was, was here. So we sometimes come home, 
sometimes New York, it was all over, and Barbara Fromm interviewed us hmm. as to what it was like to be a commuting couple because it wasn't something people thought of. So here we are today having a whole big eight-year research project on that kind of thing. And I have to add that for the last 20 years, I have lived, led a commuting life. I've worked in Russia, uh, Pakistan, all over doing impact assessments of mines, hydro projects, uh, oil and gas on communities. So I'm very familiar with all of the commuting. Um, a, a couple of comments. The word impact was used continually, but it was used, um, this is probably, a, I'll say it's a suggestion, impacts are both positive and negative. And I think you have to be cautious that in the research that you don't dwell, there are issues. I'm not glossing over any of it, but there are also positives and mitigative measures that can come from both. So I would, that's just something. And I was glad to hear you talk that in the sense that there was positives on Long Harbor. Um, and obviously there are huge adverse impacts that are going to occur too. And um, the other thing is, again, what you all know, and uh, Mike uh, mentioned in the beginning, we are a province, way before we became a province, of commuters. Mm -hmm. That's how we've survived. That is the ingenuity that we have had wherever others happened. I've been doing a fair amount of work in uh, the United States in the Rust Belt and uh, the whole Appalachia area and all the rest. And it's a big generalization, but they did not have the ingenuity of Newfoundland and Labrador. They stayed mm -hmm. and waited for things to happen to them, for government programs to come, that the coal would come back, that all of these things. And it is one of the saddest places on the earth. And it is a huge area, and it is a fentanyl crisis like you've never seen. In, uh, in even in Canada and even in you know British Columbia that, there, so we sh we unlike Trump we have to draw on our background because it has been our tradition forever. It doesn't matter where we were. When I first started working in this area, it was the Great Lakes that you know in the whole of Bay, Lar Bay Largent and down and through there was up there. I mean, obviously we're working Labrador. People were always on the Labrador. I mean, it's just. So we, we need to acknowledge that it is a tradition, a, a, a tradition here, and we can look at it and say, well, how can we build on it? Um, and if we hadn't commuted, we would have far fewer communities than we'd have now. Mm -hmm. Because what would have happened to these communities if we hadn't so, uh, shown that ingenuity? And I'm not saying it's good or bad, mm -hmm. it, but there is that part of our heritage that has helped us to stay here. The other thing is that um, I'm now working in some places where they have closed the mines, closed various other places. And um, so I've had the opportunity to look at what were the negatives from the point of view of workers, interviewing workers. And there are the positive and the negatives, things that we often forget. Um, I've been working in uh, uh, near Attawapiskat, which you're, many of you are probably familiar with. Um, they liked the commuting because it allowed them to be on the land the rest of the time. So they were able to work. Well, what people don't realize is out of Attawapiskat, there were over 120 people working at uh, the Victor Diamond Mine. And you never ever have heard that in the news. But they were able to go and still go goose hunting, still go trapping, although not many of them do trap. But the point was, it was good for many of them. The other thing, that I hadn't ever thought of until I started doing the exit interviews and the rest is that they develop communities there. Even in Fort McMurray, there are communities that are of mobile workers. Mm -hmm. um, and they were really sad when the mine closed because they had formed these relationships that they wanted to keep and that was hard to do. So th those are just a, a couple of, of things that as we're looking at this, and I think the thing is to as we always say, look at the negatives or the adverse and ha how to turn the positives into that just to make it. Because if we don't do adjust, I mean, we could be in New York City where I worked, commuting two hours each way. We could be in Toronto. You're commuting. We, it's a way of life now. Do we like it? No. But it allows us in Newfoundland to stay here. I have stayed here despite mm -hmm. commuting for 20 years. Thanks, Thanks, Susan. Long-winded, but I'm passionate about the show. <laughs> Thank you.
Anyone want to respond or comment on that? No specific question, but lots of observations that resonate. Kelly. The commuting for 20 years is an interesting point because we've asked people whether they intend to, in some of our surveys, whether they intend see themselves continuing to live in their community a year from now, five years from now into the future, and, and they say yes. So people are, it's sort of a long-term commitment. This is a lifestyle we'll, we'll maintain if need be, just so I can stay home. Um, the, but the positives and negatives is a really important point. We've certainly, uh, hopefully that came across, that we were seeing positives. Certainly the income coming into these communities, the ability to survive, to stay there, that's all because of mobile work for, for many people. So there's, as you say, the pros and cons. I think that Joe can probably speak a bit to uh, how you, I think, w I mean, we've taken the inspiration from the, some of the small towns, big industry initiative, and to, to try to do exactly, to think about, well, how do we maximize, how do we take advantage of the opportunities to the greatest extent possible, think about, say, how to get people to reinvest some of their additional income into their communities. For, so how do we take advantage of that additional income? Or how do we minimize the negative impacts? So one of the things, I think, is the power dynamic that you talked about is that it's tricky, especially for the host communities when you have large companies and small communities and that sort of to try to wrestle as much benefit as you can out of it and to convince companies and governments to put to invest in trying to minimize the impact negative impact so I think you you've tried to do that through various organizations in Long Harbor area so maybe you can speak to that kind of so point a couple of ways so uh, early on it, uh, uh, we work with uh, Dr. Cooper uh, Tom on, on developing a good neighbor agreement I mean we're dealing with a monster company and we're a very very small community and uh, their resources and assets, so of course we're no match for them whatsoever. So the, the point of it is, well, how do you get along with a company that big if, if you're the little boy on the block, you know, and there's the big bully up on the hill, and has got all the resources in the world, and you've got to coexist. Well, that's, that's not easy to do. And, uh, you know, sometimes you live by the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we existed, as Dr. Cooper pointed out, uh, for a couple of centuries, long before that company ever got there. So they're a visitor in our town. They're, they're in, in, within the confines of our community. We have a history and a culture and a lifestyle that needs to be protected and nurtured. And, 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 and the company has to buy into that. If the company is only there for sort of a profit motive and we're going to create some jobs and we're going to give you a tax benefit or a tax agreement and go away and leave us alone, let's do our job. Well, that's not the way it works. For the simple reason that the people don't buy in to having the community. The community will never be happy in that town, and the town will never be happy with that company. There has to be buy-in, so there has to be a vested interest in the community, and, and the people in the community have to have a vested interest in the company. If that doesn't coexist, then there's, there's dysfunction. You know, this doesn't work. So, so we've worked with Dr. Cooper on a lot of research in that area, and hopefully uh, this is something that we'll be able to uh, to pilot in the in the months and years ahead. Now, in regard to that, I know there might be another. Uh, I'd like to say uh, there's sort of a cause and effect here because when the company indicated that they were coming to Newfoundland and they were going to come to Long Harbor, they negotiated with the province of Newfoundland the provincial benefits agreement. Now, the province of Newfoundland had huge impact, and this is not unique to this province. Uh, this is in every province in Canada uh, that the communities are not involved in any of the provincial benefit agreements. In the discussion, don't exist. The government are looking at it from the 30,000 foot level and uh, the communities have to live it every day. They have to host these people, they have to host these companies, they have to host these workers, the employees, and they have to find a way to solve problems. They get no assistance from the communities. The Municipalities Act doesn't address it. If I went to the Confederation building today and I said I want to talk to the assistant deputy minister or the director or, or the deputy minister or the minister who's responsible for community benefit agreements, I wouldn't find anybody. There is nobody to speak with about these issues. And these are important, important issues. And uh, British Columbia has a problem, Alberta has a problem. Every community in, in every province in Canada has the same problem with dealing with large companies and small communities that you, you have to negotiate, you're left to your own devices to negotiate your community benefit agreement. And usually you're under-resourced in, in comparison to the size of the companies that you're meant to deal with. And by way of example, uh, the town of Long Harbor negotiated a, a payment in lieu of taxes. 
They used to call it a grant in lieu of taxes. That's a bit of a, an insulting term. This guy's like the company was giving you something. So they were giving you nothing in, this, in, in a real sense because you were giving them something. It's in reverse, it was the true fact. For the super reason to be in your municipality, and under the municipality, you actually have a right to tax. You had the right to tax that company at a fair rate. Now, you can't build a Taj Mahal on the back of one company, but at the same time, you have the right to set a tax rate. The companies like to have a tax agreement in place because it gives them, you know, a long-term predictable budget item that they know where they're going. And there's no surprises. The communities like it because it gives them a long-term predictable revenue stream upon which to do their community infrastructure and developments. So that's important to them. So these things all have to be negotiated. But one of the keys, and everybody will tell you, is that, that the province of the provinces, the leaders at the, at the provinces, have to start engaging the communities to help with these community benefit agreements. Okay, and we have Sarah, one of our virtual online panelists, and then we have a question online that we'll go to with Kathy after Sarah speaks. Over to you, Sarah. Yeah, uh, here I am. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, uh, so just a couple of quick comments. I appreciate the comments, um, I think it was Susan, about uh, sort of, you know, negative, positive uh, impacts. Um, and I think, you know, researchers, one of our pieces of bread and butter is doing, you know, good critical work, right, to think about what's going on here. Um, but I, just a few comments on that. So I think one of one of the sort of positive, you know, impacts of mobile work is is really for industry, and especially as, as in the oil sands, for example, um, using mobile work for operations and maintenance rather than short-term project work really is a benefit to them because it, it allows for a steady and manageable and predictable workforce. Um, at the same time, it can have positive impacts for those workers, right, depending on their life situation and all of that. Um, for the community, I think it's interesting to think about what the positive impacts of mobile work are. I mean, when I started my work in 2007 in Fort McMurray, um, the, the, the chorus in the, in, for those who called that community home was move here, move here, move here. If you're going to come here to work, move here, move here, move here, move into our community. And, and it took them a while to come around to sort of embracing the idea that mobile work is just sort of part of life here, right? And so how do we actually work with that instead of uh, imagining everybody's going to move? Um, and then the third thing I wanted to point out just quickly is that I think it's not so much a question as mobility. Is mobile work itself, you know, or commuting good or bad, um, but really what are the options available to people? And if, if the only option is, right, to go on the move, uh, no matter what the consequences, then we have a problem. Um, and also what are the infrastructures and supports available, right, and have they caught up? Have infrastructures and institutions sort of caught up to the realities of, of mobile work as an increasingly, you know, um, uh, uh, core piece of, of, of work um, uh, in today's economy. Thank you. I have a quick comment before we move to our next question. One of the other positive impacts that we saw uh, from the specifically tied to the mobile works is for the um, transmission line that they were building through the community, they needed to construct a camp for the workers. And they put it in a part of the town that didn't have access to sewer and water. And so part of the agreement of putting that camp was to extend sewer and water to that part of the town. So the town was able to benefit from that. So we are certainly seeing some of the positive. I think when we get into our host communities, it becomes a much, uh, labor mobility becomes one aspect of this kind of relationship between these big industries and these small communities. So we're certainly seeing that play out across the province. Thank you. Uh, or Kathy Newhook from the Harris Center has a question emailed in. This question is from Dr. Rosemary Omer uh, at the University of Victoria. And this question, it's for the team. I assume it's the on the move team she's referring to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, have you found any examples of situations in which male or female workers were introduced to a wider world, acquired a new sense of themselves, and then felt restricted or had to reconsider the structure and or validity of their current familial position or responsibilities, given the more traditional lifestyle in which they had previously thought of themselves or been embedded back at home. Thank you, Kathy and Rosemary. Who'd like to take that one on? Personally, uh, in the group, um, that's not something that we've seen. Um, everybody who's doing it, um, they just 
have this intent purpose. Uh, I mean, of course, they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't like it. My husband loves his job. Uh, sometimes people have said, give that up. What are you doing that for? You know, this is too hard. Just, why don't you find something else in town? You know, okay, well, that's all well and good, but that's not what he wants to do. This is his job. This is his career. This is what he enjoys. But um, that's a double-edged sword because even though he enjoys it, that comes with a very great sacrifice. Um, and that is all of the things that Sandrine mentioned, um, you know, missing our children's firsts. Uh, they're growing, so they're much more aware of where Daddy is, uh, how long he's gone, and they are able to um, communicate their feelings now. So I know that they can tell me, you know, I, I miss Daddy. I want Daddy to come home. When's Daddy coming home? Um, my little boy said to me today as I was driving him to daycare, and these are his exact words, keep in mind he's four, uh, Mommy, when is Daddy coming home from the oil rig? Not for a little bit yet, buddy. He'll be home before Christmas. Um, and he said, well, you know, how come he can't come home sooner? Well, buddy, you know Daddy works on an oil rig and it's in the ocean, right? And he said, yeah, but does he have to work on the oil rig to make me money for my piggy bank? <laughs> and I said, no, Daddy works on the oil rig so we can have a home. And Daddy works on the oil rig so we can have food in our tummies. And that's why Daddy has to go away. Um, and... Everybody else who um, participates in discussions and shares their stories within the group, they all really say, you know, they're doing it for their loved ones. And as much as they would like to be home, this really is enabling us to stay home. Uh, my, you know, my husband went to Alberta to gain the experience knowing how hard it was to get into the industry um, without experience in Newfoundland locally. Uh, in Alberta, it was uh, a lot easier to um, move in from you know, your, the, the lowest level and, and work your way up. But the intention was always really to come home. Uh, and moving to Alberta, it's really hard as, you know, we were in our late 20s, early 30s. It's hard to integrate into community um, because, uh, you know, we're not going to school, we're not in social settings where we're meeting large groups of people and can form, really form those relationships that would make us want to stay there. Um, there's something about Newfoundland that draws everybody back here. It's just like this gravitational pull. We all want to come home. So that was always our end goal. And I've, I haven't experienced anybody who says, oh my God, you know, I just, I got a, a taste of it and this international travel and I want to go here and I want to go there and you know, shag home, this is my new life, this is my destiny. I, I've, I've never never experienced anyone saying that, you know, they all do what they do, so they're f if they can't be home, the people they love can be home. The people who they're providing for can be home, so. Thank you. We have another question in the hall, but does someone have another response to that question? Okay. Uh, Taylor, you can get the mic down to, I think it's Charmaine. Yep. You can introduce yourself. Is the mic on? Okay, try that again. Oh, we'll get you another one. We have redundancy. Okay. Yeah, Charmaine Allen. Barb, I remember a book you had me read years ago. I remember Voices from Offshore? And talking about a lot of the issues that you're talking about now. And of course, I grew up in a community on the south coast of Newfoundland where and in Fortune Bay in general. Uh, you know, there was a mass exodus every year of men going off to Lunenburg and Nova Scotia to fish on Grand Bank schooners. So, you know, the stories around in my family are my grandmother rearing up 11 children pretty much on her as a single mom, really, and the importance of extended families that lived in the house with her. And it would be interesting if you add families that are you know, young families now compared to what, you know, you know, people that are 60 or 70 or 80 years old, what they experience, like what would the difference be? And, and back then you had no technology. I mean, you had women whose husbands went off six, seven, eight months a year. You didn't know if they were alive or you were listening to them on old radio sets to see if they were, there was a storm. So that's one part of it. So it's, I think it's pockets in Newfoundland. And, in, and I, once again, I see research being done at this university 
and I understand the restrictions of, of geography, but Fortune Bay was the hub of migratory workers forever in this province, right? And it's an area that doesn't get mm. tapped into a whole lot when it comes to research at, at this university. That's one point. But the other point is, too, I've had the experience of having family members go off to this Alberta thing back and forth. And I remember picking my brother up at one point at the airport when he was commuting. And I was absolutely amazed with, with how many men got off the airplane drunk mm. or stoned mm. because they were afraid of flying and they were taking medication to deal with the flight. They were taking medication and alcohol to deal with being away from their families. I'm not saying all the men that got off the flight, but I was amazed with how many there were. Mm. And I talked to my brother about that, about the alcohol use, mm. because you're doing drug testing, right? But about the alcohol use in the camps in uh, Fort McMurray uh, or in, in that area. And I've had a talk recently about the drug use in St. John's about the inherited drug problem in this province. And I see your policy pieces at the end of your presentation, but I don't see anything about any kind of links between the drug issues in this province that we have at the moment and the commuting, working and going to Alberta or wherever they're going. Uh, that's number one. And a friend of mine also told me recently about the rise on, in STDs in this province mm -hmm. and the connection with mig uh, migratory workers mm -hmm. going back and forth and the reality that some of them do uh, engage or take comfort, I don't know how you would put it, in drug, in um, sex trade mm -hmm. in Alberta. And, but, but I don't see any policy, policy relationships with that. And I think these are, you know, these are areas that we really should be looking at with, you know, Planned Parenthood. There should be, you know, connections made with Planned Parenthood or Newfoundland Sexual Health Center to see if that's an issue. And certainly with the amount of, you know, in this province there are no or very little drug rehab uh, facilities uh, to avail of, really. I mean, there are some, but not a lot. And I, I'm just wondering if you're looking at that in your research. Thanks, Charmaine. Who would like to go first on the panel on those? Well, it's certainly coming up. We're hearing a lot, um, and especially this summer when we were up in Labrador, about drug use. Um, not only associated with the workers, but coming into the community and affecting community members as well. Uh, we're hearing about a rise in mental illness because those boom bust uh, kind of dips in the industry and people getting laid off and not being able to pull in those big incomes anymore and perhaps having debts and, and other issues. Um, anecdotally, you can certainly see it and we haven't done a, a lot of research. We're just starting to look at the health side. And that's not really what traditionally our background has been, but because it did come up this summer, especially when we were doing the, the field work in Labrador, we're trying to dig a little deeper into that. But I've been really um, surprised to see some of the news articles that have come out in the last month about some of the opioid prescription use in Newfoundland and Alberta, and those are the two highest uh, provinces for those types of prescriptions. So I wonder if there's some kind of connection there that we're not s either seeing come up in the in the research quite yet, or if we can dig a little deeper in that regard. Uh, Doug in Cape Breton has actually done some work on the treatment side, and he's looked at people accessing treatment um, for methadone and how they were trying to do some interprovincial streamlining of that so that a worker who was working away in Alberta could still access their treatment and they could also get it when they were back home. So Doug's done a little bit of work in that area. In uh, community medicine, who was doing some work on sexually transmitted diseases and mobile work. Do you remember that? Spoke at the at one of our me provincial meetings, but that was in our early years, in the first couple of years, and I don't know what happened with that since. So it's a, it's good to to raise that and to maybe try to reconnect with some people yeah, who are doing work in that area. There was a, a whole project that was developed to look at precisely those issues, both drug issues and sexually transmitted diseases, but it wasn't funded. It was a spin-off project. Um, and so I'm not quite sure where that's gone, but I know I was part of a large group that was discussing that, and some people on, on the move were also supposed to be involved in that if it had been funded. But I agree with you. I mean, I'm watching fentanyl. It was interesting. Your observation on the Rust Belt was interesting in that area, and I, th I think we do need to look at that. When people move, things move. But one of my concerns is, and I've heard this anecdotally, 
uh, is that w one way to fund your mobility if you're not being moved by companies is to, is to take drugs and sell them. And it's a huge issue in terms of uh, resources uh, for treatment and so on in rural areas in particular. And I know Christina Murray's work in Prince Edward Island, one of the issues there, she's got grandparents who are dealing with drug addicted parents and they're left with the grandchildren and the responsibility to try and help the drug addicted parents, again, in a rural area without uh, supports. Now, you can have drug addiction without mobility. Uh, the question is, again, what's the relationship between those things? Uh, and again, there's all the discussions that you get on construction sites and so on about how drug testing drives people to more to cocaine and other types of drugs and away from um, marijuana and things like that, right? So that discourse is widespread as soon as you start looking at the industry. Um, but again, it's very hard to find solid data on that, right? We have a quick comment from Joe, then a quick comment from Sarah, and then wrap-up comments from Greg. Oh, Melissa also. To uh, address what you said uh, when you spoke about uh, women in, you know, uh, prior times in Newfoundland who lived in small communities, many children, husbands gone, don't know when they're coming back, if they're coming back. Um, I think, uh, and a hu this comes up in the group, that uh, we don't have really a lot of help from extended families, and I think part of that is uh, because people are working longer. Um, so my in-laws, they both only retired this year. Um, same thing with my uh, stepmom, my dad recently. So when we had small children, they, they still had, they were working full time. Uh, they weren't able to help me out. They weren't at my beck and call. They had, uh, you know, their own work commitments, uh, commitments outside of, of work and uh, household um, duties. So that prevented them from being part of my support system. Um, and when it comes to... Uh, STDs and drug use. I do want to say that uh, part of the group, we have been advocating for a bigger um, active role from employers uh, for the workers who are transient. Um, they really need to focus on their emotional health and their mental health, and that for two reasons. One being, it affects health and safety on the job. Um, are they under the influence of drugs? Are they emotionally unwell because of the pressure that it's putting on them and their family? Um, and, and of course, they should be, they should have a vested interest in that. They don't want, you know, on the job uh, incidents and downtime. Uh, so uh, we've made a little small step there by sharing our group on a, a health and wellness board that's actually on some of the offshore rigs uh, that's been shared by the uh, oil management companies. They've put it up with, uh, we put it up with their approval. Um, that pressure and the money, I think that is uh, probably a driving factor for the drug use. And uh, as you said, you, you know, you have to be ready for randomized drug tests. You squat your finger, you're going for a drug test. So I think it uh, promotes uh, the harder drug use, such as cocaine, because it quickly uh, exits your system. Uh, the absences, um, you know, part of the pressure of the... Of transient workers is the pressure on the marriage and then there's broken trust, there's infidelity, um, there's workers who are going in other provinces and uh, you know when they leave uh, the work site they're staying in a motel that might, I mean my husband in Alberta sometimes the only restaurant in a town was a bar and a strip club. Uh, that was the only accommodation so um, I've heard many stories about uh, infidelity and, and uh, that happening on the road, and it would definitely put uh, families uh, at a higher risk than for contracting STDs and spreading STDs. Um, and uh, basically, we just really need uh, better supports uh, for the emotional and health side of things, and I think then that will kind of shift over and help people move away from uh, drug use and infidelity as a way to cope using those coping mechanisms. Thanks, Melissa. Short comment, Joe, and then it's Sandrine, not Sarah. Yeah, just a quick comment. I just uh, wanted to say that, uh, that, that to Ballet's credit, they had a, a very stringent safety program on site out there. Uh, they, they've operated for a very long period of time. Their lost time accidents were minimal, and uh, they had uh, no deaths on that site over a six or seven year construction period, a $6 billion project. 
And I think that was due to the fact that uh, the mandatory drug testing that they had on site uh, kept workers safe and everybody got a chance to go home every day. And I also say from a community's point of view, uh, we were really pleased with that. Uh, in, in a six year period uh, that we were looking at this thing, I think we had uh, one person in the community who had to be uh, uh, dealt with and because of uh, drug use or intoxication. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when coming out to dances and things like that at the community center. So just one in six years, and these are some you know, pretty hard-nosed boys that were out there uh, uh, drinking and carrying on and skylarking and whatever, when you only can remove one and that person lost their job. But, but at the same time, that's a, that's a testament to, uh, uh, to good management. Okay. Uh, Sandrine. I I just wanted to point it out another aspect of not so much uh, what we can call recreational drug use, but uh, also the use of medication um, by workers. Uh, so in the interviews we did, uh, several workers mentioned using medication to treat themselves and not having to call their employer and say they were physically unable to work, being worried of uh, of being laid out because they, they, they would have uh, physical injuries. So several workers were treating themselves using medication uh, and other drug in order to keep their job. So it's, it, it, it brings also the, it calls the um, attention of the role of employers and of better, of supporting better the, the, the workers. Thank you, Sandrine. Now this Memorial Presents is really on the move because we're gonna go as far in Canada as you can go for a wrap up five minutes. I know he's very succinct and articulate. Greg Hulseth is Canada Research Chair Rural and Small Town Studies at University of Northern British Columbia. And uh, over to you, Greg. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Barb had asked if I could provide some uh, wrap-up comments, and it was my great pleasure to, uh, to agree to do that. And it was a really a terrific pleasure to uh, listen to the panelists, the speakers, the questions. Everyone was terrific. As we know, changes in the way we work and changes in how our economies are organized have been underway for a long time. And as individuals get caught up in the ebb and flows of these changes, uh, most of the time it's a challenge to discern if our choices are good ones, if they're good for ourselves, for our family. We can't always predict or forecast the implications and the costs and the benefits that might be borne by or accrued to ourselves, our families, and our communities. Um, as was noted at the beginning, uh, employment-related geographic mobility is not an especially new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon at all in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador. But changes in transportation technology and changes in a wide range of industries and the way industries are organized have made it a much more pervasive phenomenon and hence the interest uh, and dialogue around projects such as this. And I'm really grateful to today's presenters and to the On The Move project, the partnership project that is backstopping each of these presentations uh, for helping to shed light on some of the contemporary organization and structure of employment-related geographic mobility and for helping to organize our thoughts on the processes of this activity and its implications. I'm also really pleased with the way they organized today because I thought they focused upon what I feel are the two vital scales for employment-related geographic mobility, the family and the community. And from everything I heard today, I can certainly say that we would echo these findings in what we see in Northern BC. Sandrine, I thought, did a fabulous job introducing us to the family scale of impacts. Her five core findings were really ones that spoke to anyone who was involved in uh, employment-related geographic mobility, both for the opportunities it created for the worker and the family, but also the costs that were borne by the worker and the family. I was especially struck by uh, how the burdens were falling to family and extended family. And it really made me think uh, about an evaluation of whether this activity pays if more and more of our family uh, needs, to, needs to step up and take part of that burden. 
uh, highlighted quite rightly the still strong gender divisions that flow through employment related uh, geographic mobility for individuals and families and uh, some of the challenges for what are very real functional lone parent families. I thought that uh, Melissa's very powerful and very personal sharing of her own story was a wonderful compliment uh, to Sandrine's story. Uh, Melissa, thank you very much for sharing a really uh, powerful story of disruption and feelings of loss, but also strength and feelings of resilience. And as suggested by some of the questions, right, there's an opportunity through these processes to both redefine ourselves, redefine our relationships, redefine our places uh, in the world. I thought that Melissa's messages about valuing each other in a couple relationship, valuing the time together, messages about the need to provide clarity of access to services and connect people with services, but also the general need for people to have understanding and to have sympathetic shoulders uh, to, to call upon were all really important and really spoke to uh, what Sandrine highlighted were the emotional impacts that disruptions such as this uh, can bring, the, the highs and the lows emotions, often with very little in between. Um, some of our, uh, um, our findings that link with this work speak to a redefining of emotionally loaded words such as man, husband, woman, wife, family, marriage, and home. Turning to the community level, I thought again that Kelly and Heather did a fabulous job of introducing us to the wide range of, um, of issues that are occurring uh, in home and host communities. Um, very important to highlight the differences between these and how those differences are significant. Their work showed us how the level of activity is really high in one and low in the other. Pressures on community services, high in one, low on another. Pressures on community infrastructure can be exceedingly high in one and low in another. And I thought Joe's story on the panel uh, particularly where he highlighted the differences in capacity between the various players in his theater or play of community development was really uh, quite an important addition. There are some significant differences in scales uh, relative to the skills and capacities, but also to the commitments to localities. And I think sharing stories from industries that have been positive community partners are really are quite important. I thought as well his opportunity uh, taken to highlight the sort of nexus of threats and opportunities that come with such projects was also uh, a very, very uh, important. For Kelly and Heather, I thought it was also neat the way they highlighted not only differences but also similarities between host and home communities. Challenges with the voluntary sector, flowed through both. Challenges with managing and maintaining community activities flowed through both. Challenges with household and especially community stress and the lack of supports to cope with that stress during periods of disruption really flowed to both. And the competition for labor uh, flowing through both. So sometimes they're set in juxtaposition, but I thought Kelly and Heather did a nice job in highlighting how many times these, part, these communities are in fact partners in a suite of powerful stories and flows that resonate across Canada. So for me, of course, there were some significant uh, social questions that came out of this. You know, as capital became increasingly globally mobile, employment-related geographical mo mobility allowed labor to also become more globally mobile. Well, that raises some tough social questions. First of all, uh, there are opportunities for labor to build new skills, to learn from different work environments. So how can they work towards uh, creating new opportunities for themselves and their families? I thought the story that ended Bob and Pauline's really powerful and intimate video was really instructive in this regard with Pauline setting up a bed and breakfast where Bob boasted about how she had learned all the skills 
while away and now is starting a new uh, business on her own. But maybe not all of that opportunity to be globally mobile with your labor is a choice. Maybe some of it's coercion. Maybe our states have failed rural regions in inadequate community and economic policy. By not having jobs locally, are we forced to uh, travel? Is this part of a, of a failure on the part of the state? And then a third issue is, has that burden of reproducing trained, skilled, well-rested and able labor increasingly falling away from capital and more to labor, labor and the family themselves? This has been a long-term and ongoing process and employment-related geographical mobility may just be the newest iteration of that. As we saw through all the presentations, there are some pretty significant costs that flow to home communities, to families, to children and workers. And I thought Sarah did a nice uh, addition to this piece by highlighting the de facto uh, flexible labor pool that may be being generated in this period of employment. Certainly, by looking back at the recent downturns in Alberta, we see an industry unconcerned with cutting loose tens of thousands of employees at a moment's notice and putting communities not only in Alberta but across Canada into turmoil because at that time, at that point, they no longer needed that labor to be available to them. So this puts large segments of society in a much more, much more precarious employment position than they have ever known. I wanted to finish with some comments on policy because across all of the presentations, they all cried out and they spoke to the need for readiness. So I had to ask myself as I listened, why the hell weren't we ready? This isn't new. These kinds of opportunities come and go, certainly at a provincial level with provinces seeking this kind of investment. We should have been ready, and shame on us all for not being ready. So how do we turn the good news economic stories from becoming bad news economic and community uh, stories? Well, in terms of policy, I think we need to focus on how to support home communities and families in employment-related geographic mobility. They are benefiting and the state is benefiting from that transfer of flow and benefits economically. There's a political and a moral imperative to solve the readiness problem by supporting home communities and families. I think at a second level, there's also a policy issue about supporting host communities and the workers who participate in employment related geographic mobility through accordion services that can expand and contract as Joe highlighted, all those workers that came to town to, to, to build that plant, expanding the services in health, wellness, policing, first responders, drug and alcohol management, uh, physical abuse issues, sex trade and crime, and then contracting them when the workforce transitions from a construction to an operations phase. Not, it's not rocket science, we should have been able to be ready. A third area of policy that was really highlighted throughout the presentations was about how to lever the opportunity of increasing levels of investment in host communities for periods of time when new facilities and infrastructure is built so that we can provide long-term better housing services and infrastructure that will serve that community a long time after the boom is finished. Um, just as uh, Melissa talked about the ongoing value of her support network at an individual level, I thought Joe's story about the hotel was particularly informative. Creating an asset, paying it off through an economic boom, and then having an economic and development asset that can be useful to the community for decades into the future. Building local government capacity, but especially building provincial government responsiveness and the creation of place responsive and supportive public policy is going to be critical. So rather than, am I closing, rather than looking at impacts as good or bad, we need to recognize that there are just going to be impacts. What we do with them, how we mitigate challenges and how we take advantages of opportunities will, how we, will be how we are judged 
by future generations. In closing, again, thank you, Barb, for the invitation, but thank you to everyone who participated. This was a wonderful and informative learning experience. Thanks a million, Greg, and thanks again to the panel and presenters uh, present in the room and virtual. Thanks, Barb, for your leadership in this whole project and in pulling all this together. As Barb mentioned, they're in the synthesis phase of all this. Don't forget the conference at UPEI in May 17 to 19. Contact Barb and her team for more information on that. The Harris Center will be helping, and uh, the whole team will be producing loads of material that will inform policy and practice Everybody in Newfoundland and Labrador and across Canada is living with this reality, so there couldn't be a more pertinent topic. So uh, really important for us all to learn from each other. Beautiful example of engaged research, community, family, scholars working together. Uh, if you're viewing online, there's an evaluation online that you can click on, fill in, please do. If you're here in the room, please fill in the evaluation, leave it with our staff on the way out. Thanks to the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning at MUN who produce this. It'll be online in a couple of days on the Harris Center website and the On the Move website. They do a superb job every time. Thanks to Mike and the Harris Center team for all their support. And thank you for coming out tonight. And good night. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our public forum on the impacts of, on families and on communities of mobility for work. My name is Mike Clare. I'm the Associate Director for Public Policy at the Harris Centre here at Memorial University, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. We have a small but enthusiastic crowd here in the uh, Bruno Centre for Innovation on the St. John's campus of Memorial University, and of course there are those of you who are watching online. Welcome, everybody. I would like to begin by acknowledging that these lands are the historic territory of Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have always gone away from home for extended periods because of work. Whether it was to go 100 miles inland to cut trees for the paper companies during the winter, or to go up the Labrador to fish during the summer, or to go to the Great Lakes steamers that, to carry grain or iron ore. People in this province have been away from home for weeks or months at a time to earn a living.